Hi everyone, Fran here. This week has been hard with no Arsenal football. The international break has sucked. So I'm going to deliver your football fix today. We're going to be talking Kai Havertz. We're going to be talking about Arsenal's attack. We're going to be talking about Arsenal signings. Are Arsenal more exciting? Less exciting? Are we better? Are we worse? All of it. We're going to get into all of it. And I really hope you enjoy the video. For those who don't know me, I go by Goal Art. So I'm an Arsenal fan and a football artist. I just love everything to do with football. And today I've got some questions for you. Let me know in the comments. Do you think Arsenal are better than last season? Or do you think we have actually regressed since 2022-2023 season? Where, of course, Arsenal led the league, the Premier League, for the longest ever time without actually closing the job and winning the Premier League title. Do you think we are good enough this year to win the title when we were pipped at the post last year by Manchester City? Let me know what you think and whether you're happy so far with what you've seen from the team. Then please do subscribe because on this channel I chat a lot about Arsenal, a bit about other clubs and also I film videos of how I've drawn portraits of Arsenal footballers and soon other footballers too. Using my portraits I make clothing which you can see around here so I scan my art and turn it into clothing which I hope to be able to build into a business to donate to lots of charities and things like that so you can find out more about the brand Goal Artso on my website which is goalartso.com the link will be in the description that is enough of the pleasantries let's get into the facts and the figures and I'm going to try and stay emotionally neutral but if you've watched my channel before you know I'm I can get a little bit heated, politely heated. I'm so annoyed. But um, we'll get into it. You guys do not need me to go over what happened last season. I don't think any Arsenal fan needs reminding of what happened towards the end of last season. Instead, let's talk about where last season ended, what we did over the summer to try and do one better, and how those signings have started to settle in. So, as you know, we finished second last season. For a lot of the season, it looked like we were going to win the Premier League um, for the first time ever in my fan watching career. Um, and it was devastating when we tripped up right at the end. So what I really wanted to see going into the summer was something that was going to take our team just that little bit better because we were so, so close. I wanted to see signings that could come in straight away, improve the level of the team so that we could go on to do one better when we were so heartbreakingly close last season. So I personally would have been happy if we got three or four ready to go players in the positions that let us down so badly towards the end of last season. So I wanted a new defender in case Saliba got injured again, um, central midfielder because Thomas Partey appears to be a little bit made of glass um, and maybe one or two more attacking players. And on top of that, we let Granit Xhaka go, so we needed a left eight replacement. At the time, I was quite shocked that Granit Xhaka was going because he was such a key player in our consistent run of form last season. It seemed like it was kind of wiping the slate clean and starting afresh a little bit when we were doing really well how we were. But I do understand that Granit Xhaka had stayed longer than he already wanted to and he was promised that he could leave by the club. So what I was really hoping for was a direct replacement for Granit Xhaka so that the team could essentially carry on playing how we had been playing for the majority of last season. But that's not quite what happened. Mikel Arteta has taken a huge gamble and signed Kai Havertz from Chelsea for 65 million plus, I believe, pounds. And this has led to a lot of discussion and debate about whether our midfield has in fact got worse since last season and in fact our whole attacking play. But we can't put that down to one player. We have to look at the team as a whole and what tactics we're using this season compared to last season. We're just going to compare all of it. We also signed the incredible Durian Timber, which you can see I painted him behind me. It's one of my favourite paintings. But anyway, um, I was over the moon with that signing. We saw how incredible he looked when he played, what, one or two games in pre-season, got injured in the very first Premier League game, which I think might be the worst bit of luck for any player that we've had in recent history. Um, I was so excited to see him, and unfortunately he got a really long, lengthy recovery process. I just wish him all the best, and we can't wait to see you back, Durian. Of course, another key defensive reinforcement Arteta signed is David Raya, um, one of the best performing goalkeepers last season from Brentford. 
Um, I know there's been a lot of chat about this, but I think he seemed like a fantastic bloke, really great goalkeeper. Unfortunately, these things do happen in sports. I used to be a goalkeeper um, for kind of regional hockey, and I was always competing against this one girl who was slightly better than me. So I empathise, emphasise, empathise for Aaron Ramsdale, but all this will do will make him a better goalkeeper in the end. So if you're going to play David Raya and he's a step up, that's only a good thing for Arsenal. I fully back David Raya. If he's going to make us better defensively, let in less sloppy goals, then I'm all for it. And again, showing just how much Arteta is focused on improving our defensive record this season. So in that sense, is our defensive squad better than last season? Yes, but no in practice because Tim was injured. In midfield, we have had a huge improvement, which is bringing in Declan Rice, big deckers for what, 105 million, biggest, most expensive signing in Arsenal history. I could not believe it when we signed him. <laughs> I, 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 you know, last season I was having a go at us for penny pinching, looking in the bargain bucket, and we went and did it. We acted like a big club, went and got Declan Rice, and he. I, you guys have heard how amazing Declan's been. You've seen it with your own eyes. I don't think I can repeat again and again and again just how amazing he is. Um, that is a huge, huge improvement from last season. We, of course, probably expected him to play with Thomas Partey, but it looks like he's going to be a replacement for Thomas Partey or indeed play the left eight. But the midfield is a whole separate thing. So big step up, but then losing Thomas Partey kind of negates that. But overall, I think... A real step up in the midfield, at least in that kind of right central midfield-y position. <laughs> so that was a fantastic signing from the club. Um, have the signings done well enough? Are the tactics good enough? Are they better? Are they worse? How are our figures? All of it. So much to answer. So much to find out. I've been delving into it all for about a week. We're going to sift through it all together and try and come to a sense of clarity by the end of this video. So we have played 12 games in the Premier League so far. I thought the most obvious thing to do would be to compare these first 12 games with our results against the same teams last season. I know they're not quite the same teams. Those teams have changed a little bit. We've changed. But that should give us quite a clearer idea of whether we're performing better or worse against the same teams last season. <laughs> So what you can see in the left-hand column is our first 12 games of the Premier League season this year. And then on the column on the right, with the yellow facts and figures, are the results in exactly the same fixtures, wherever they happened to fall last year, when we came so very close to winning the league. So really what this will show us is whether we're doing better or worse against the same teams. Um, you can see at the bottom, though, where we've played Sheffield United and Burnley, I've switched them out for the teams that ended the championship in the same position that those guys did last season, this season. So the promoted teams, basically the closest parallel that we've got to Leeds and Leicester last season. Uh, Sheffield United is, Leeds would be the closest comparison based on where they finished in the championship. And then playing Burnley this season, Leicester is the team that I compared that result to last year. This year, when we started the season, we played Nottingham, Forest at home at the Emirates. This year we won 2-1 compared to last year when we won 5-0. Next we played Crystal Palace away and this year we won it with a slim lead of 1-0. Last year we won by 2-0. Right, playing Fulham, this was our first draw of the season. Uh, we were playing at home and I don't know if you remember but one of Fulham's men got sent off and they still managed to come back and draw the game. I think we were winning 2-1, they came back to draw the game 2-2, really disappointing result. I remember being really annoyed at that point because, you know, we were we had one more player than them, they still managed to score. So uh, we're going to make a case that our defence is better, but stuff like that is really disappointing. Anyway, so this year we drew 2-2 um, when we played Fulham at home and last year we won 2-1. And Manchester United at home, quite a big fixture. This year we win it 3-1. And last year we won it 3-2. So <laughs> they did score one more goal against us last season. Right, Everton away at Goodison Park. A famously tricky fixture for Arsenal. This year we won it. We broke the Goodison Park curse, winning it 1-0. Compared to last season where we lost 1-0. So that's, that's better. <laughs> Next, Bournemouth 
away. Last year we win it 3-0, this year we win it 4-0. So if you're going by the idea that a lot of people are that we're scoring less goals, I mean, fixtures like this make me question that because this year we win it 4-0, last year we win it 3-0. Um, but Bournemouth are, are pretty weak, so um, <laughs> we won't draw any conclusions from that. Next, the big one, the big boys, uh, our rivals, probably, hopefully, <laughs> um, based on last year, our main rivals, Manchester City, at home. Last year, they came to the Emirates and beat us 3-1. This year, for the first time, it seemed like forever, we actually beat them. 1-0 win. And this was the first point in the season where rather than feeling disappointed at seeing less exciting football, I was buzzing after this game. I'm pretty sure I did a live stream afterwards, but I was so, so happy to see that we'd switched up the tactics and were playing really conservatively. I didn't want to see us go out and play how we usually play against City, which is keeping the exact same attacking style of football and just always losing. So it was a real step up in maturity from Arteta for me, for him to really compromise on our attacking style of play, play really conservatively, defensively, and actually get a result against them. Um, so that was a huge win in my book. Right. Last year, when we played Chelsea away, we won 1-0. This year, we drew 2-2, so not quite as good. Sheffield United away, slash Leeds United away. Last year, we win 4-1. This year, we win 5-0, so pretty similar. Right, Newcastle away at St. James's Park. Last season, I was thrilled because we won 2-0. Such a difficult um, away fixture. This year, though, we lost it 1-0. And refereeing decisions aside, we did not... We, we had one chance, I think it was, or something really similar to that in that game. Um, we just didn't create enough going forward. And we were unlucky to concede. It should have probably been a 0-0 draw. But last year, we won it. 2-0 this year we lost um and Leicester slash Burnley away no at home sorry <laughs> this year we win it 3-1 so 2-4 versus 3-1 pretty similar pretty similar comparison so that was me just running through the results against the same teams this season versus last season and what is actually interesting is to compare the overall figures um from those results I just read out so Last year, we scored 30 um, in these 12 games. This year, we have scored 26. So, scored four less goals, which isn't actually as many, as much of a difference as I thought, considering how less exciting our team is to watch. I'd have thought there'd have been more of a gap, as in we'd have scored way more last season. So, it's actually not as much of a drop-off against these same teams as last season, but it still is four goals less. No, it has felt like we've conceded some sloppy goals still. Last year, we had a 19 goal difference across these games. This year, we've got just 17. So pretty similar. The direct results were last season, we got 10 wins and two losses, which gave us a total of 30 points in these 12 fixtures. This year, we've got eight wins, three draws, one loss, giving us 27 points in these fixtures. So what can we take from that? For me, looking at the title race, what I first go to is the points total from the same games. And we've got three less points compared to last season. And when every point is like gold dust against Manchester City, that's quite disappointing for me. I'm left in a quite pessimistic state. Um, but what I'm going to do is look at the main reasons why people say that Arsenal are in fact better, even though in the same games we've not had quite as many points as last season so far. Let's look into our defensive improvement a little bit more. Defensive figures last year in those games, we conceded 11. This year we've conceded just nine. And you might know that actually this season in the Prem, Arsenal will have the best defensive record. So that's a really good start. We've lost less games, but we've drawn three. Um, but I remember last season saying, <laughs> I wish we would draw a few more games and we have, but that's meant that we've lost more points. So I'm pretty conflicted about kind of where this leaves us. But my main takeaway is that we've got three less points than we did against those teams last season. And if we're looking to better our second position of last season, is this good enough? Is this doing better than last season? Let me know what you think in the comments from these direct result comparisons. 
Although I would caveat that the start of our season, we have not had Gabriel Jesus, we've not had Tom's party, we've not had Jurian Timber, our new defensive signing. So the injuries could be affecting the results compared to last season. However, it's up to the club to build enough depth to combat that. And in a way, I feel for them because we got Jurian Timber, but he got injured in the first game of the season. So the figures are more similar than I would have thought. But at the end of the day, against these same 12 teams, we're three points worse off than last season, which isn't looking great for me. So we've played about a third of the games this season in the Premier League. We've played 12 Premier League games out of 38. So just coming up to a third. And I think that's kind of a fair place to start predicting where if we carry on at this pace, kind of where our numbers are going to lie by the end of the season. We've played 12 matches out of 38. We've scored 26 goals and we've conceded 10. So from here, basically, because we're nearly a third of the way through the season, what I've done, it's kind of cheeky, is basically times these by three. <laughs> so that would be basically saying if we continue playing the way that we're playing for the rest of the season, what can we kind of reasonably predict that our final figures will look like? So if we carry on how we are, we are on track to score about 10 less goals than last season, which is why I'm trying to look at how we're improving defensively. But whenever I'm trying to explain that to you guys, it seems like inextricably linked to worsening attack. Um, and is it a direct correlation or is it just our defence is way better, but something has changed in our attack, which makes it way worse? Or is it because our defence is better that our attack is looking way worse? I don't know. I don't know. We're on track to concede 13 less goals than last season, which is fantastic. So where does that put us in terms of the figures that are normally needed for a team to win the Premier League? So last season, Arsenal conceded 43, which is way out of the realms of what normally wins the league. Liverpool in the Premier League season of 1920, when they won it, they conceded 33 goals. The next three years, Manchester City conceded 32, 26 and 33. So you're looking just above 30, that crazy season by Manchester City where they only conceded 26, that's wild. But how are Arsenal looking in comparison if we carry on going the way that we're going? We are on track to concede just over 30 goals, which would be low enough to typically win the league. Our attacking stats last season, we scored 88. Liverpool won the season in 2019-2020 season, they scored 85. And Manchester City, the next three years, scored 83, 99, unbelievable, and 94. This season, though, if we continue going the way that we're going attacking-wise, we're on track to score 78, which is 10 less goals than last season and typically not enough to win the league when teams like Liverpool and City have been winning it in the high 80s, even 90s. So if we stay the way that we are, we will shoot just over 520 times by the end of this season. This is if things don't pick up attacking-wise. That's compared to 593, nearly 600 last season. Basically, we were getting way more shots away over the whole season last season um, and this is kind of worrying uh, if we carry on how we are we will create only 48 big chances which is kind of just over one a game less than two a game um, I think yeah less than two a game compared to 73 big chances which were created last season that's a huge drop off so clearly something is going wrong in the attack even though the defense is doing so much better so for me, it's a great positive that our defensive numbers are on track to win us the league this season. They're in the right realm for the league winners. However, our attack was there last season and now that's completely dropped off, even though our defensive numbers are much better. If we had last season's attacking numbers and this season's defensive numbers, we would be good to go. Sam Dean from The Telegraph put it, on the most basic level, the result of these changes is that Arsenal are defensively stronger and more mature than at any point in Arteta's tenure. The heightened level of security and midfield control has come at a cost though. In the eyes of many supporters, they are simply not as exciting to watch as they were a year ago. You can see there in open play XG expected goals. Um, Arsenal are in the bottom half of the table. We're really not creating many goal scoring opportunities, not many expected goals. It's a real worry for me and I'm sure it is for the team in Arteta. Let's look at the head-to-head -head kind of attacking figures between Arsenal and Man City. So, so far in our first 12 games, Man City have scored 32 goals, Arsenal have scored 26. 
their goals per match average is 2.67 ours is 2.17 so that's not actually that much less they've had 198 shots to our 174 so quite a big drop off there shots on target they've had 88 we've had 64 which again is quite a big drop off their shooting accuracy is a bit higher so 44 percent compared to 37 percent so they're getting more chances and they're better chances we're getting less chances and shooting less accurately however if you think about our attack last season it was predominantly whenever they could it was party Xhaka, odegaard and then a front three of martinelli jesus and saka and this season we have had no party patchy odegaard or that <laughs> not really patchy he's been around for most of it um, no jesus no martinelli so of course that's going to disrupt things but you'd think you know with arteta having been here four years you'd have enough attacking depth to be able to rely on players like Vieira that you've been building up to play in these attacking roles, um, Eddie Nketiah, Reese Nelson, and the drop off when players like Martinelli are not playing um, and Trossard's kind of playing in weird positions, the drop off from our ideal attacking players to the ones that have been substituted in at the beginning of this season, for me, it's too high. You can't help injuries, but you can prepare the substitutes to be able to perform at a high enough level to keep your attacking play alive it just looks so much worse without jesus martinelli and hopefully when we come back from this international break jesus looks like he'll be fit martinelli's fit saka's fit odegaard will be back in theory <laughs> our attack could be back to near its best but what i haven't yet touched on is the central midfield could it not really be down to injuries, but to the fact that there's a giant granite jacker shaped hole in the middle of our midfield and we're great at defending, but we're really struggling to get forward and create chances. Could that be a granite jacker problem? We will get into it. So I've just gone over the kind of projected numbers, if we stay how we are, for Arsenal to concede this season and for us to score this season. And as I said, we're on track to concedes few enough goals to win the league but not quite score enough this season and we were scoring enough last season so we're a slightly different team this season as it's beginning to become clear <laughs> we've covered the main reason why people argue that Arsenal are better than last season which is that our defense is much more solid and I am very relieved you know every time that we lost the ball last season it looked like that team was going to break and just score a fluky goal this season, it feels like we're much more protected from teams hitting us on the break, and it's lovely. It's a bit calmer, but it's very frustrating watching us try and score. We've been over that. <laughs> Another argument that Arsenal are in fact better than last season is that there's less chaos, less unpredictability, and more control, which I touched on earlier. The more we can control these games and have it in our hands, is there more of a chance that we can kind of engineer our own victories in the league rather than rely on chance and fluke so much like we were last season. We're not so open to going a goal down, two goals down, then having to tussle our way back into games. And I do see that, I see that. Arsenal are facing fewer shots, conceding fewer chances and allowing fewer touches in their penalty box than they were last season. They're also more secure with the ball. Last year, Arsenal lost possession within 40 metres of their own goal around seven times per game. That's not good. <laughs> this season, that high turnover figure is down to just five per game. Arteta's view of football stems from his education at Barcelona and the work of Johan Cruyff. The Dutchman's philosophy was based on the importance of ball possession. Cruyff once said, when you dominate the ball, you move well. And then he said, you have what the opposition don't and therefore they can't score. So that really strongly links into perhaps this philosophy of having the ball, conceding less chances, controlling the match, being in charge of your own destiny. Something that Arteta seems to be leaning heavily into this season by reducing the chances against our own goal, the high turnover rate, and also really focusing on calm possession football. Sam Dean goes on to say, in Arsenal's case, more of the ball means more control and more control means fewer opportunities for the opponent. This season, they have had more possession on average than last year. Their number of accurate passes has increased to from 459 per game last season to 499 per game this season. So, yes, uh, alongside the better defence, we've got more possession of the ball. 
So clearly more control of the match, hopefully and therefore more control in our results. <laughs> and here's a quote from Arteta from a few years ago, I think, where he says, we can only focus on what we can control. A lot of people have levelled the criticism against Arteta that he might be a bit of a control freak. Um, is this huge kind of emphasis on control this season kind of cutting off the natural creativity and flair of some of our players? I think it could well do. And that's when I get into my final argument about why Arsenal are potentially better this season than last season, despite you know, all the things I've said about the attack being worse, us being less exciting. Something that's really impressed me so far, and I think will play hugely into how we finish the season, is the way that Arteta is pacing the team. Arguably, what has been improved this season is our ability to peak right at the end of the season rather than completely lose the plot. And Arteta said earlier this season, 23-24 um, season, it's about having the ability to change gears. We have to play at different paces. And it's about rotation, giving players more breaks, more rests, and also the actual pace, the speed of the game. So often we've heard that the game is slower, slower passes, slower running, they're jogging around the pitch. Are the games slower? So that we have more energy, you know, stored up for the end of the season. Did we just run our socks off too early, too soon last season, meaning that we were completely done by the end of the season. Injuries caught up with us, the players looked absolutely shattered. Are we playing slower to conserve energy? I think we might be. That or our attack is just completely dead on its feet. But I think we're playing slower for pacing reasons. And it looks like Arteta was quite traumatised <laughs> with how our season kind of spiralled out of control at the end of last season. Um, so he was speaking to a publication or company called Marsa over summer and they asked him, this is a Spanish one, so he was able to kind of speak more freely in his own country, in his own language, felt a bit more comfortable and he really opened up about kind of what went wrong last season, how it affected him and perhaps why, <laughs> as a result, there's so much more emphasis on being in control this season. So he was asked what was missing to win and... Mikel said a lot of things. We were penalised by those three draws in a row that we had. Poole, West Ham and Southampton. Liverpool. And all the misfortunes that happened. Two comebacks going two up. So, yeah, those comebacks where we were in control of the game and then it kind of descended into chaos and we went on to drop points by drawing those games. That did really affect him. Uh, that was the first thing he answered when he was asked, like, what was missing? And he was saying how we were conceding those leads. So he also said there were three or four injuries of important players and from there everything got complicated. Yes, yes it did. Uh, when we had the whole team, we were consistent. As soon as problems came, it didn't catch up with us. Uh, not quite sure what that bit meant. And then our rival was the best team in the world, the best squad in the world, the best coach in the world. We had no choice but to accept it and shake hands with the champion. Uh, okay, so what I really take from that is that the first thing he said was those three draws in a row, Liverpool, West Ham and Southampton, which is basically where we conceded the lead that we'd had all season to Manchester City and those comebacks and things. So clearly his sight is set on being able to maintain our fitness for the end of the season. So again, with that same interview for Marsa, he was asked, did you ever see the winner of the Premier League in this team? And Mikel answered, in many moments, the team gave me arguments and we had a connection with the people. He believed in it. But when we started to have injuries, I felt that it was going to cost us. The level of demand could not be maintained. If you want to win the Premier League against City, you have to arrive in April, May with all the players available and at their best. And we, due to injuries, didn't get to that. So I think Mikel Arteta has thought, how do we stop that happening this year? How do we arrive in April, May and not have this injury crisis at the end of the season? And the result appears to be playing out on the pitch in what we've decided to do. That's rotating more and playing slower games at less intensity <laughs> with less effort perhaps so clearly he's got this newfound understanding that we don't have to be at 110 percent every single game 
and that is what we loved so much last season and actually what i've been crying for this season go where's the intensity the intensity's so bad lads but the f <laughs> i think what he's talking about the different paces the different gears is that we want to be able to win matches not having to play 150 percent every single game everyone playing out their skin we want to be able to play a more chilled out kind of game like when you watch Man City and it looks like they're playing in third gear, but they still win comfortably or win 2-0, 1-0. We, I think he really wants to be able to do that. He wants to be able to go out, play slightly slower balls, not have everyone sprinting all around the place, having them being a bit less shattered when they come off at the end of the game and still be able to get the result. I have been impressed this season with the rotation. It does feel like there's a lot more of a squad focus. So I still would like to see more. Um, but we have seen more minutes for players like Vieira and Trossard. He needs more minutes. I want to see more, more Kivior minutes. Nelson, um, who else is there? Jorginho. We are seeing more of a squad rather than just first 11 or bust. I still would like to see even more of it, but it's so much better than it was last season where the same 11 players were playing week in, week out. This time it's kind of when you're doing your starting 11 lineup. In videos and stuff there is actually debate as to who might play this game horses for courses type thing different players for different games it's much better than last season and if he keeps it up i think he's still quite worried about trusting some of these players but stay strong Mikel. <laughs> keep this up and this rotation has two benefits so first of all our star players will have more legs toward the end of the season because they will have been rested second of all it's a contingency plan for if our star players at the end of the season get injured. So even if they aren't available, these second string players will have got so much more game time that they'll be fresh and ready to be relied on. Whereas last season, it felt like players like Holding and stuff, when they came in later on, there'd been so little rotation earlier on in the season that they came on completely not match fit, basically. You can be physically fit, but if you're not playing competitive match minutes it's completely different you've got to be playing competitive match minutes in front of the crowd to be raring ready to go otherwise you're just going to take a few games to catch up you're not going to be good enough keep up the rotation so that these players are ready if we do need to rely on them at the end of the season and also to prevent injuries for our star players so i mean i guess let's kind of summarize a little bit i do strongly believe that a lot of the criticisms that we have had towards the team this season is in fact things that are being done by design. The less exciting style of play, the less intensity, the slower ball pace, the more conservative play. It's being done to conserve energy, increase our control and have an improved defence. Those are the three main things that we've really improved on this season and also which make our team a bit less exciting. So you've sat through my <laughs> probably boring analysis of why our boring football this season is a good thing, <laughs> as much as it pains me to say. And now I can't avoid it any longer. I've spoken long enough. I must talk about our midfield. And to do that, I must talk about Kai Havertz. So, as you know, we had Granit Xhaka's best ever season last season. The player that we all hated for years, you know, um, had the biggest redemption arc. We were singing that we wanted him to stay by the end of last season. I think it was fine that he left, but there was going to be a big Granit Xhaka shaped hole that we would need to address in the transfer window. As I said earlier on, I think a lot of us were hoping for a ready-made Xhaka replacement and someone that would come in and basically pretty seamlessly be able to continue on the great kind of box-to-box -box role that Granite had taken up last season. What I really wanted was someone who you could just drag and drop and maybe after a couple of games of adjustment could do the same role as Granite Xhaka and allow the rest of the team to function the same way as last season. For me that makes real logical sense. Why would you shake up one of the two main midfield roles when you don't need to and when it's working so well. For me, just get someone who perhaps is a bit more mobile and can help on the counter-attacks a little bit more. Maybe he's a bit more defensively reliable. We know how Granit Xhaka 
coped with things, <clears throat> karate kicks when there was him on one on one situations. It, it just wasn't good. So someone with a bit more mobility and also that could continue to do the same nice runs into the box and help out with a few goals. Easy peasy. Um, who did you want in that position? In hindsight, I think James Madison would have been great, which makes all of this much worse. But who did you want there? Who do you think would have been a like for like Granite Xhaka replacement? I don't think any of us would have thought it would be Kai Havertz. And I feel like I'm just entering kind of the void now. I've spoken about it so much. The decision baffled me. It still baffles me. I have so many questions. So many questions. I didn't actually see this quote, but apparently Arteta did say that he bought Havertz in to be the left eight. If you could, if you know that exact quote from Arteta, I want to make sure I'm not like spreading misinformation, but I'm pretty sure that he said at one point that he bought Kai Havertz in to be the left eight, the direct like for like Granite Xhaka replacement, but absolutely not like for like. His playing style is really different. So first of all, I thought it was a joke because in what world do you look at the Kai Havertz professionally, not as a person, <laughs> and his performances at Chelsea for the last three years and think him, he's the one that we need. Perhaps Arteta was thinking, right, he's a different style player, you know, he's much more kind of... I don't know. <laughs> he's a very different kind of languid player, okay? He's a very different gait. I don't know. He's very different. What I'm trying to say is he's very, very different from Granit Xhaka. And all I can think is that Arteta has seen him. And I think the vision is with Kai that he can basically be a really elegant, classy Arsenal player. And I think the plan was to put him in left eight and he'll be this elegant kind of effortless player doing quick touches and not like really showy, but quick, elegant touches all over the pitch, beautiful goals at the end, a bit like his Leverkusen days. If you haven't watched um, Leverkusen highlights, watch it and you can see that vision, you know, um, rangy, elegant, quick passes, control, light, classy, you know. Um, I think that's what he was hoping to have in our left eight position. And combined with things like Kai Havertz's aerial height, he he's very tall. <laughs> I think taller than Granite Xhaka. And he's very physical, which is something that with his kind of elegance of run, that you can argue or floppy, I don't know. <laughs> his style is, is, <laughs> is it's so hard. Um, there's also um, an underrated physicality that Kai has. So he can have the kind of defensive tackles and things that were so crucial which Granite Xhaka gave us but add more in attack perhaps uh, be better in better better in the box with things like headers contribute to more goals but I mean immediately I think looking at Havertz's record at Chelsea why do you think he's going to be this incredible attacker when for the last three years um he's really really frustrated Chelsea fans I watch a lot of um like Chelsea fan channels, Matisse like cracks me up and he hated Havertz at Chelsea. Um, so you're kind of thinking maybe he does have a really great attacking talent there like he did at Leverkusen and Arteta knows how to unlock it. And that's still probably the aim. And also, he's scored in the Champions League, so maybe he can help out in the attack in that competition where it's not quite so fast-paced as the Premier League. And perhaps it's showing real ambition for the Champions League. And this is where I get annoyed about this signing because there were so many players that you could drag and drop, like on a computer, who would come in and be able to hit the ground running. Madison really, really annoys me. And Liverpool have remodelled their whole midfield with players like Gravenberg, Schlobberschlein. Um, who, you know, after a tiny couple of games of adjustment period, are they're, they're, they're on fire, you know? As Havertz, you've brought in someone who's potentially going to be really good. And I get it, I get it. He could still be, but by the time you've got him to that level, will this season have slipped through our fingers? And will we have come third, fourth, when 
really we could have got someone who was ready to go and seize the opportunity to get one step better and win the league this season as opposed to coming runners up last season. For me the argument would have been get Kai Havertz, although not for that money, get Kai Havertz as a project player and then someone I mean, these players that Liverpool have got, Madison, things like that, they're much cheaper than Kai Havertz. Get someone like that who can be plugged into that position right away so that you don't have to wait for Kai Havertz to click. Get two. Could you have used the summer budget, which was massive, in a better way? So, like, maybe getting a Kai Havertz if you were so desperate to get him, but then also someone who right now you could rely on to do that job. Or as it's turned out, Kai Havertz has come in and he's performing how we did at Chelsea, maybe marginally better. And I don't know if Arteta expected, which I can see, to be fair, Havertz to come to a new environment. Top, uh, Chelsea was very toxic all over the place. We know that the players were so unhappy they had like triple the amount of players. Like they couldn't even all fit in the changing room. I don't blame Arteta for thinking. Let's bring this guy into our amazing environment. We've got the dog. We've got a great comrade, we've got great team spirit, the guys are really nice. Bring him into a happier environment, he doesn't even have to move house. And he's gambling that perhaps just that, like the change of environment will... You know, it, it, when your workplace is nicer, you're so much more likely to perform. However, I think it was too much of a gamble to say, change his environment, change the atmosphere around him, and then his game will start to pick up. It's not as simple as that, and... I can see why he'd think that his game would improve real quickly, but it's not. Clearly there's more of an issue there. There's confidence issues. There's, it's all, it's all confidence really. And it hasn't been solved by this move to Arsenal. Perhaps, <sighs> I don't know. I really just despair. I really just despair. And like what hurts the most is seeing these other midfielders. Like it's just that the, the, the situation was so simple to just get a replacement that's going to perform straight away and it's been unnecessarily complicated by bringing in a project player that may pop may not was most likely not to because i mean the way that you predict future performance is by looking at past performance isn't it so the greatest predictor of what's going to happen is what has been happening for the last three years and it's exactly what's happened kai havertz is playing how he does why would he come in and play completely differently to how he's played for the last three years? You're getting the player that you bought. If you look at Kai Havertz at Chelsea, that's what you've bought. And why would you expect it to be any different now that you've slotted him in this team? Perhaps he did. <sighs> when you do change your the entire team that you're playing with, obviously your game will change a little bit, but you're still the same player that you have been for the last three years. You're not going to transform overnight into this vision that Mikel has for you. You're gonna be that same player for a while. By the time you've got Havertz firing on all cylinders, will we still have all the rest of the quality around him? I know a lot of our players have signed up to long-term contracts, but will this squad with incredible potential still be as good as it was last season and could have been this season if we just got that right cog in the left eight position correct? By having someone that's not working in that left eight position, you're really pulling back on the potential of the team as a whole and perhaps missing the chance this season while you're waiting for Kai Havertz to work for this season, this group of players to go on and win the title. I'm so frustrated by it. So yeah, Kai Havertz was brought in as the replacement for Granit Xhaka and we've got some quite interesting heat maps here. So there's Granit Xhaka's heat map and you can see the red areas is kind of more concentrated where he was basically the red of the areas like the way he spent more of his time last season so it's this kind of central left column up and down the pitch box to box left eight position that granite jacker roll you can see it and now look at his direct replacement bottom right kai havertz the heat map looks nothing like it um and Kai Havertz was started in that position and he's not doing any of the same things that Xhaka's done really. And then you can see how he's been moved to different positions like up front, more recently playing like the Odegaard right midfield position. Just from that heat map, you can see just not doing at all any of that job <laughs> that Granite Xhaka was doing. Right, so you can argue, is Declan Rice filling the Granite Xhaka void? Um, 
firstly, Party's been injured, so Declan... Well, Jorginho has kind of been the party replacement, and Declan Rice, he is not playing the left eight role. He's more of like an all-over galactic traveller. He goes here, there and everywhere, putting out fires all over the pitch. So he's not filling that box-to-box, -box, attack, defend, on that left-hand side role that Xhaka was. Fabio Vieira I included because he's kind of another person where it's like, oh, could he be our left eight? Like, is that the plan this season? But you can see he's just not had nearly enough game time. And he, again, is kind of all over the place in his positioning. That's not doing what Granit Xhaka has done. What I did find interesting, though, um, is last season and this season, the closest heat map to Granit Xhaka's is Zinchenko's. So you can see that he it's identical nearly this season to last season. The positions that he was taking up to compared, compared to what Granit was. Um, so it was Zinni and him last season in those areas, really linking up, um, progressing the ball, helping defend. Um, and this season, Zinchenko is doing that same thing. So he's... But the problem is, so Zinchenko, you can see the heat map for 22-23 up there, is he's doing what Xhaka was doing last season. So it's like, oh, Zinni could be the number eight replacement. But the problem is they were both doing that last season. They were both in those positions. Even if Zinchenko is, say, the Arteta moves him into the left eight position, he's doing his job, doing that Granite Xhaka position, then you still need a left back to do what Zinni was doing with Xhaka last season. So, yes, Alexander Zinchenko could replace Granite Xhaka in the left eight. He's in those right areas. But then you're still missing a left back to do what Zinchenko did last season. Maybe you could have Tomiyasu and Kivior, or Kivior play left back. And then, basically, what I'm saying is Zinchenko, at the moment, is the best, by kind of the positioning, is the best, and the where he naturally plays, would be the best replacement for Grant Xhaka. Um, that would be what I would propose to Mikel Arteta um, moving forward. Move Zinchenko into that left eight role. Because look at Kai Havertz's positioning, it's clearly not where he's comfortable playing. Zinchenko is comfortable playing in those zones where Xhaka operates. And also it would remove quite a lot of Zinchenko's deep defensive responsibility. Um, which has been kind of the main criticism of him last season and this season. For me it seems so simple to just slot Zinchenko into that left eight role where he is kind of a like-for-like -like replacement. Since we haven't brought in anyone externally, move Zinchenko there. Havertz isn't working, move Zinchenko there. That, for me, is the solution. So, at the end of this video, where do I sit? And I'm feeling really conflicted because I do fully, fully buy into the fact that I love that there's more control and less chaos. I love that our defence is better and I love that we're pacing ourselves and I would really strongly argue that although it's not as exciting, for those three reasons, the improved defence, um, more control and less chaos and the more rotation and pacing makes us sit in a way better place than last season and I feel much more hopeful that we'll finish the season strongly and I think we've got more of a chance at the title this season if I look at those things. I do. Um, I'm really hopeful that all this will pay off and we'll finish the season strongly. Oh, and I did say that I would touch upon our chances, the way that this style of play I do also think will help us in competition football, where generally the teams in the Champions League that have the best defence will win it. I can do a whole video about that, but that's the case, <laughs> basically. Um, the teams that have most control and less chaos, unless you're talking about Real Madrid, tend to win competitions like the Champions League. So I'm feeling really hopeful about our chances in the Champions League with us having the best defence in the Prem this season and the Prem's attacking play is so good. So I feel confident about us going into the Champions League and really not conceding many goals. However, I am very worried at this point, a third of the way in, about the numbers of goals and big chances that we are creating. And also the left eight position.
those are my main kind of worries. I'm fine with the goalkeeper. I think Raya's great. I actually really like him. Our defence is great. Um, uh, our squad is great, but the attack and the attacking midfield area is not working for me. And we saw by the numbers that if we carry on in the same vein that we're going, we're not going to score enough goals to come anywhere near winning the league. But we seem to have fixed the things that let us down at the end of last season. Um, so, you know, the chaotic unpredictability, the sloppy defence, the fact that all our players were burnt out, um, they've been directly addressed and we're seeing those changes this season. But our attack is not good enough. How do you think that the attack can be improved, which it must, um, as the season continues? If we stay attacking the way that we are, we saw that we're not going to score enough goals to win the league. And to take away from this video, our defence is good enough. Our defence is great. Our attack needs to be better. And let's see if Mikel and the team can achieve that. And let's see if in January we see directly the club addressing that issue. So look, that's about all I have for you today. If you're still here, it means that you like stats, you like talking Arsenal, you like talking football. So we will get on. <laughs> Please, if you've enjoyed it, do all the usual YouTube things like click like and click share and please subscribe if you haven't subscribed. My name's Fran. If you're still here, thank you so much for watching. I decided to pre-record this video rather than do the usual live stream because there was just so much to get through. And if I was doing the live stream as well, I would get distracted, I would lose my train of thought. And I just really wanted to kind of present and try and clearly get through all of the data and ideas <laughs> so I hope you forgive me for not going live but I really want to hear all your thoughts about everything we've spoken about I'm exhausted this presentation is like I've been researching it all week thinking about it all week mulling over everything all week all season <laughs> I've really enjoyed this I hope you have too let me know what you've thought of the video and please do check out my website golazzo.com where you can see all of the artwork that I do. So I love talking about football like I have done today. I love watching football, but my real passion is drawing footballers. I love it. They're so inspirational to me. And you can find out so much about why I do that and how I do it on the website and see all of the portraits I've done of our Arsenal players. And soon for you guys from the other clubs, I'm going to be drawing just like general footballing legends, even if they're from other clubs in the Prem, I know. Um, so I might be drawing like Mo Salah, maybe Kane, because he's not at Tottenham anymore. But anyway, um, if you subscribe to the channel and if you go to my website, you can stay updated on all of the players I'm going to draw next. You can always comment as well on my YouTube videos who I should draw next. Next I'm drawing Bergkamp and I'm waiting for some new paints to arrive. That's why there's been a delay. Um, but next it's going to be a video of drawing Bergkamp. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to continuing talking about football and also doing the painting. It's a really cool balance, I think. So thank you so much for watching. Please do go and check out golartso.com to look at the merch I do. So I scan the art. Um, this is one of my hoodies. Um, so yeah, it's it comes in like lots of different colours. Hoodies, I think, are £25.99 on my store. Um, yeah, with the hand-drawn design. And it's basically, the idea was to make like Arsenal merch that you can wear that's not just like your full match day kit so like casuals that you can wear with like your normal clothes but still like have a connection to the club and like that goes with like graphic streetwear style so um there's also this gabriel jesus one this little t-shirt um with my drawing again in the center and the t-shirts are 19.99 and they're all printed on 100 percent recycled fabric so please um <laughs> I haven't been plugging it much recently, but I'm going to release a few more designs soon. I'd really love to like get the site going. So you can go over there and get 15% off your first orders. Um, you can go over there and all of the proceeds go back into my art supplies and like print the printing side of things. Um, and it will just help me to be able to make more designs like this and do more paintings. So if you like that stuff, please do consider it for a unique Christmas present for yourself or for a loved one. Just any Arsenal fan. I've also got like kids sizes as well. And I'm going to be doing a video soon about basically Leandro Trossard's wife 
asked me to make a hoodie for them, for their family. So I drew Trossard doing a celebration and scanned it and made a hoodie for her. I'm just waiting on them to send some photos of them wearing it. But yeah, that was really cool. So please, please go and check out the merch. Message me with any questions through the website. You can contact me through the website about the merch. And thank you so much. Um, as for the channel, I'm really... We're on the road to a thousand subscribers. I'm really, really excited. I really want to get to that a thousand mark and then I'll do a massive giveaway. Um, so yeah, please do subscribe if you have not already and hit the like, get this video out there. <laughs> Thank you so much again. I will see you all soon for another video. I'll try and do them as regularly as I can, but hopefully soon I'll be able to do my art full time. Um, that is the aim, but right now lots of real life work. So. I hope you enjoy the rest of international break if possible. Um, not long till Arsenal are back and I will see you next time. Up the Gunners. Come on you Gunners. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.